Okay, in uh, chapter 16, this is going to be a uh, part one here, and we're going to talk about the molecular basis of inheritance. And um, this picture here, this just shows Watson and Crick kind of showing the world the uh, double helix that they had kind of determined from doing the um, kind of investigative work on a lot of other people's research. So um, the main idea here is that the essential structure of DNA is ideally suited to its function, okay? So um, from a TOK standpoint, it says highly repetitive sequences were once classified as junk DNA, showing a degree of confidence that it had, a, had excuse me, that it had no role. To what extent did the labels and categories used in the pursuit of knowledge affect the knowledge we obtain? So take a second there, um, just kind of go through, construct an answer, and then um, we'll go over it in class, okay? All right. So here's a video that we'll watch that kind of shows the meselton stahl experiment that we're going to talk about here in a second, okay? So after Watson and Crick determined um, that DNA was a hereditary material, the main question now was how is DNA replicated? And the um, strands are said to be complementary to one another. So in other words, if we have an A, T, C, and G, of course, then we have T, A, G, and C, so they're complementary. And then, of course, as we've shown in class, if we split these apart, we can generate this uh, whole thing here by each of these strands there. So they're complementary to one another and that they, they each can give rise to the other, okay? And the, the structure of DNA, after Watson and Crick had determined it, uh, determined it they um, you know, proposed a mechanism for uh, replication, of course, the semi-conservative model. And since each, cran, each strand contains the information to construct the other, that's what uh, kind of made the semi-conservative model um, the most uh, promising, I guess you'd say. But what you still have to do is rule out the other uh, modes of replication. You can't just say because it looks obvious that that's the way that it happens, okay? So Watson and Crick, of course, proposed a semi-conservative model because the um, strand, when plied, plied apart, contained half of the information um, from the original strand and then half which would be new according to the semi-conservative model. And then the other half, when it was pried apart from the original, would give rise to another strand which was um, new. And um, so what you end up with, for instance, if we start with something like this, of course, and then something like this, and then when we give rise to it, when these two pry apart, you would see something maybe like this, and then there's the new strand, there's the other new strand, and there's the old. So this one here gave rise to each of these new ones here after one round of replication. Okay, and we're going to go over more of that in a minute. We, of course, done so in class. So they couldn't rule out the conservative model, and they also couldn't rule out the semi or excuse me the dispersive model. So um, they had to go through the the kind of the kind of experimentation or experiment uh, experimental process to determine which mode of replication it actually was. And Meselson and Stahl were two people um, that were able to kind of you know, elucidate how this thing did through, or how this uh, DNA um, replicated itself through experimentation. And of course, we discussed this in class. What happened was, is the E. coli cells were um, cultured in a medium containing heavy nitrogen for a long period of time. So there's two common uh, isotopes of nitrogen. There's nitrogen 15 and there's nitrogen 14. And neither of them are radioactive or anything like that, but um, they're, they're just the two most common isotopes. They're very stable. And what happened was, is they grew the E. coli cells in this nitrogen for many, many generations. And nitrogen, of course, is needed for um, the DNA of the organisms. And so um, uh, what they were able to do is essentially construct these E. coli cells that contained nothing but um, nitrogen 15 in all of their biomolecules, including, of course, the DNA, which is what's important here. And after several generations now, the bacteria were then transferred to the medium containing the lighter form of the nitrogen. And um, what they showed was that during DNA synthesis now, this molecule here, or excuse me, this atom here, was what was going to be incorporated into any of the new DNA. And they chose DNA that would replicate, um, or, or I should say E. coli cells, that would replicate themselves every 20 minutes. So it made for somewhat of a quick experiment, okay? And what they did was they transferred these uh, to centrifuge tubes, and it 
you know, centrifuge did nearly 45,000 rotations per minute. So very, very fast for about 20 hours. And of course, um, if you have a test tube and you put it into a centrifuge, what you're going to get are things that are going to layer themselves out according to the density. So the density of this, of course, is going to increase as you go down. So the more dense stuff is going to be found here near the bottom, the more the less dense stuff is going to be found up here near the top. So what they did was now is they had they invented this tool microdensometer and what it was able to do is measure density differences. And what they put inside the tube was cesium chloride which was a salt, just like salt water basically. And what that allowed them to do then was put the um, DNA um, from the cells, basically they broke apart the cells and they put them into the um, centrifuge tube that contained the cesium chloride. And what they got was the DNA after being spun so fast for so long started to separate into um, a, a band more or less. And they were able to measure the density differences by shining light through it and how it was refracted. And if everything, whoops, if everything was cesium chloride in this tube here, let's say, except for the DNA that they put in, then you're going to have a thin line right through here that's going to be where the DNA is. And the density of everything else here is essentially going to be the same because it's all cesium chloride. Okay? So what they found was, is that, or what they hypothesized, they should say, is if it followed this conservative model right here, what you would get is the original DNA separating and then going back together after giving rise to the new one. Okay, so after the first replication, you'd see two bands. After the second replication, you'd also see two. And then with the dispersive model, what they found, or what they hypothesized, I should say, is that the original band breaks apart somehow and that the new bands after the first round of replication just contain bits and pieces of the original DNA. And in this case, these two things here are the same. So you would only get one band seen after um, the first replication. And then the same thing here, um, you'd get one band here after the second round of replication. Okay. And then the semi-conservative model, which was also the hypothesis of Watson and Crick, what they said was is that when this original um, band separates here, each old strand is going to give rise to a new strand. So you'd see one band here, and then you'd see two bands in the second round of replication. So if we look here, this is kind of a summary of the three. And then what they were doing was is they transferred it after 20 minutes of growing um, the... Um, one, the, the original population, of course, contained all heavy nitrogen. And then when transferring it to the tube containing N14 now, after 20 minutes, you got one round of replication. They broke the cells apart and centrifuged it out, and they were able to detect one band. Okay, so what that did now by seeing this one band is it ruled out the conservative model because according to the conservative, you'd have a band here and you'd have a band here and you'd see two bands. And when in fact, after 20 minutes, um, as you see right here, they only found one band. So that got rid of the conservative model. Then they let it go for a second round of replication. And if it was the dispersive, these would all be the same and that would be one band again. Yet if it was the semi-conservative, this right here, there's your first round band, but this one right here and this one right here are the exact same. So these two would make up one band and these two here would make up a second band, which is what you see right here. And that is in fact what they got. They got two bands, not one, and so that got rid of that. So now we've got two bands. This band right here corresponds to these, which are light, okay? And then this one here corresponds to these two, which is one light and one heavy, so it's slightly more dense, and therefore you'd see it down here at the bottom. And if we look at, if we were to take one of these um, tubes here, that has the two bands in it, for instance, or one or whatever, and kind of turn it on its side so that it's kind of facing this way now, which is what we did with these pictures. You can see after one round of replication, the density difference is only in one band. And then here, this is approximately two rounds now. We're starting to see 
two bands. Okay, so this supports the semi-conservative model. All right, so their conclusion was the semi-conservative model was what was followed because a light band was detected following the first round of replication, and then um, after the second round, you got two bands, one light and one heavy. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one, and we'll get started with part two shortly. All right, we'll see you in class.